You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for your support of The Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Today we get to talk about hymnody, which is one of my absolute favorite things to talk about. And it is the end of the church year season. It is almost Advent. We get some really great hymnody at this time of the church year, talking about the end times and looking forward to the coming of Christ. So we're going to dig into four hymns today. And joining me is Matt Mockamer, Associate Cantor of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thanks so much for joining me today, Matt. Thanks for having me, Sarah. It's great. Glad to be here. Ah, to talk about hymnody, which is so fun. And, and we're in that, that end of the church year season, which has some very specific themes. What are some of those themes that we uh, dig into in these last few Sundays of the church year? Yeah, I think the obvious one is probably, you know, the final day, judgment day, and what that means for us as Christians and what that means for the world, you know, essentially, as things in a sense, come to an end. And in another way, it's the start of a new beginning, a new creation. So that's certainly a big theme that you get through this time of the year. I think there's also some underlying themes of what the church and what Christians are to do as we wait for that time. So there's this this element of expectation, which also provides a really nice transition into Advent. You know, the transition between these two seasons is kind of seamless in a way. And then I think the third theme that I kind of pick up on on a lot of these hymns is the theme of joy, the theme of feasting and gladness. All of these things that we've been waiting for come finally in Christ when he returns. And so you have this this realization of all the things that you've been expecting are finally coming to fruition. And so there's a lot of joy there, even even though we sing about things that are pretty daunting you know, in judgment and stuff like that. But the other side of that is joy and gladness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we get to sing about all of these things. So we're going to dig into some hymns. We have an extended segment today because we never get through as many hymns as we think we're going to (laughs) when we do these. So first we are, we're going to Lutheran Service Book 512 at the name of Jesus. Tell us about this hymn. Yeah, this hymn when I was looking at this one, I just wrote down one word first that I, I that came to mind as I was reading the text and, and singing it to, again to myself. And the word I came up with is is story. It's kind of hmm. the story of Christ, at least for the, the first few stanzas. The text of this hymn was written by a woman named uh, Caroline Marie Noel. She lived in the 19th century and wrote some hymn texts very early in her life. And then had a very long kind of dry period of not writing. And then in the last 15 or 20 years of her life, wrote again. She was an invalid at this point. And so maybe with the extra time that she had kind of being stuck in her home, she took up hymn writing again. And this hymn, At the Name of Jesus, comes out of that time in her life. The tune, the hymn melody itself, was written by Ray Fon Williams, the Mm -hmm. famous English 20th century composer you know, who is well known throughout the music world, both in sacred and secular circles. But Von Williams really was interested with English folk music and also did a lot of work for the Church of England. Most notably, he was the editor for the English hymnal in 1906, which is a huge benchmark hymnal in England, and also did some work for a hymnal called Songs of Praise, which came out in 1925. And in in that hymnal, the 1925 hymnal, his hymn tune, King's Weston, appeared. He had 10 other, I think, or maybe nine other tunes for a total of 10 in that hymnal. But King's Weston is the one that still survives in our in our book today. And it's a very kind of strong modal tune, which I think fits this text remarkably well. Mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned this is a modal tune, and this has come up before on, on other hymn discussions. Can you, can you tell us what a modal tune is versus a minor tune that, that we might also run across? Sure, sure. Well, before we really got into major and minor keys, as we understand them today, church music often found its expression in terms of the church modes which basically the simplest way to understand that is if you were to start on one key of the piano 
and play up until that key repeats itself in active higher, only using white keys, you would play a mode. So the key of C up to the high C is a mode. The key of D up to the next D is a mode. That would be the Dorian mode. The key of E to the next E would be the Phrygian mode. And they all have their own unique sounds to them. Some of them sound very major. Obviously, the C to the C is our modern day major scale. Others of them, though, are very exotic sounding. You know, the E to the E, especially the Phrygian mode, or B natural to B natural is, oh gosh, I can't even remember now. It's not Lydian, maybe like hyper Lydian or something, but they're very wild sounding keys. And kind of unstable. <laughs> <laughs> this tune is in a very grounded mode and it's not unstable sounding at all, which makes it great for congregational singing. Yeah, it's a very very strong and powerful tune and I mean Vaughn Williams is just great at everything, so there's that as well. Yeah, uh, tell yeah. us <laughs> what what should we pay attention to in this text? Well, this text draws a lot of themes from that really famous passage in Philippians 2 where we talk about Christ being given a name above all other names. I'm just going to pick up at the end of this section. So Philippians 2 verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And this hymn takes a look at that that pericope and a couple others. And at the beginning of it kind of goes through the life of Christ. So stanza one is just kind of a summary for the hymn at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. When you get to stanza two, you begin to get the story of creation happening. His voice creation sprang at once to sight all the angel faces, all the hosts of light. So at the name of Jesus, the word of Christ, all creation comes into being. And then in stanza three, this creative word, Jesus, becomes man and lives among us, humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto whom he came. So now we're telling the story of Jesus. In stanza four, Jesus rises again from the dead and brings that name with him and raises it up to the heavens. You know, so in his ascension, he takes our human nature up to heaven with him. And so those first four stanzas, you get the story of Christ. And then in stanzas five and six, you get things that are applicable to us now in the church. In our hearts enthrone him, stanza five. Let him subdue all that is not holy. So now in this present time, let Jesus have his way with you and form you into his image. Knowing that in stanza six, he will come again. So... We're always preparing for that coming. And then again, it stands as seven, the response to his coming that we have as the church, one of praise, one of um, thanksgiving for his love. So we get the story of Christ, but then we get how the fact that we bear the name of Jesus in our own baptisms affects us as people and what we are to do with that as we live out our stories in him. Really great wow. hymn. It is a really great hymn. All right, let's move on to to our next one, a Lutheran service book 511, just one before this one. It is Herald Sound the Note of Judgment. What, what what do you want us to know about this hymn? Yeah, this is, you know, this is I think a hymn kind of about the church in a sense, or you can kind of understand it that way. It's a newer hymn. The text itself was written in uh, 1968 in England for the dedication of a stained glass window in a church actually. And ironically enough, it was a stained glass window about the baptism of Christ. And as you look through the text of this hymn, you can kind of see John the Baptist proclaiming all of these things. So this hymn is also a nice carryover into Advent. He sounds the note of judgment, so he warns people of their sins. He sounds the note of gladness, stanza two. Christ is coming. He's here among us now. The kingdom of God is with you. We hear in the gospel of Luke and Matthew, he sounds the note of pardon. So he's calling all of Jerusalem out for repentance, right? And then he sounds the note of triumph. And this is the note that we, we in the church have because we have been made into Christ. So you can kind of understand this hymn in a sense as John the Baptist's work 
when he first appeared, preparing all of Jerusalem for the coming of God. But I think you can also understand it as what the church is to do now. You know, obviously, we sound the note of judgment as we proclaim the law to people who need to hear it, as we also proclaim to them that Christ is coming again and there will be a judgment. But we also proclaim the, the sound of gladness, stanza two. And we, we have the gospel and we proclaim that with clarity and joy, knowing that in Christ, all things are made new and that we too are made into new people. Stanza three, we as the church, we proclaim the note of pardon, repentance and forgiveness. That's what the church is all about in her preaching and in her teaching. And as she gives out the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, the Lord's Supper, as she baptizes Christians and makes them holy, all of those things grant us forgiveness of our sins, the note of pardon. And finally, the note of triumph, which we'll realize fully at that last day, because we have been put into Christ by our baptism, because we have feasted on his body and blood. And because we have been in his word, we know that ultimately that note is one of triumph for us and we will be with him forever in glory. So it's a great, it's a great hymn for the end times. It's also a great hymn for Advent. And a, a lot of themes are happening there. And again, a, perhaps a hymn about the church in these latter days. Mm -hmm. well, we have two more hymns to talk about with the end of the church year. We need to take a quick break. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Listening to the Coffee Hour, I'm Sarah Golseth. We are in the end of the church year season of our liturgical calendar with Advent right around the corner, and we're talking about hymnody today with Matt Mockamer, associate cantor at Theologi or Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We have covered Lutheran Service Book 512 and 511, and we are going next to two of my favorites for the end of the church year. First is 508. The day is surely drawing near. What do you want us to know about this one? Yeah, this is, you know, this is a classic Lutheran hymn. And like so many Lutheran hymns, it kind of had its genesis before the Reformation. So it was originally a sequence chant uh, uh, for the Roman church. And it was actually based off of the Dieris Irae from the Requiem Mass for the Dead. And so... You know, it, it kind of has an ominous, an ominous foundation or an ominous source. And as you read through this hymn, it can be a bit ominous. This is the, the, the word that I wrote for this hymn as I was looking at it is judgment, final day. This is, this is a hymn I think that really captures what a lot of people think of when you talk about judgment day. So the pastor who wrote the text of this hymn, his name was Bartholomaeus Ringwalt, and so he takes this Dearest Ere chant, this sequence chant, and writes the seven stanzas to it that we have today. I, I just have to share this with you because I thought it was just so great. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking up in my new hymn companion, you know, from CPH, which is just a fabulous resource. The original sequence is not one or two or three stanzas long. It's 19. Isn't that great, the, the best? And then, you know, it was later published as kind of an anonymous German hymn before Ringwalt got his hands on it. And let me just read this from, from the companion to you. It's just fantastic. The anonymous hymn was the second of two published together in a pamphlet. 
The first was a 25 stanza tale of woe about girls who spend so much money on nice clothes that they impoverish their families and who reject suitors for frivolous reasons. When they finally marry, they lead miserable life lives. The second paraphrases the dearest era in seven stanzas. <laughs> what what just a, a jumpy little pamphlet that must have been. So, but this this paraphrase of the dearest era in seven stanzas, it's it's really a fabulous hymn, and it draws very heavily on Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, which, if you're a three-year uh, lectionary church, you're probably going to hear on the last Sunday of the church here in just a couple of weeks, really probably one week from this coming weekend, and it's the parable of the sheep and the goats. So it's, it's a very well-known parable about judgment, you know, obviously the sheep being the children of God and the goats being the children of the devil or the ones who go away into the abyss, the lake of fire, which is prepared for Satan and his angels. And it's a it's a pretty strong text. It's a pretty um, daunting text when we look at it really honestly. However, I think there's a lot of comfort for us here as Christians. As you are looking through the text and you're taking it stanza by stanza, it, it's quite striking. There's a lot of law here. Stanzas one and two are setting the scene. You know, the day is coming now. Flames upon flames are ravaging earth, as scripture long has warned us. And now the final trumpet sounds in stanza two. The earth is shaken, and all the dead are raised to be judged. And stanza three, the books are opened a record truly telling. So nothing that we've done on earth is going to be overlooked. And you remember that Christ says these things to the sheep and the goats. You know, when uh, I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. So all of these things that we've done for our neighbors or not done for our neighbors are remembered and recounted. And then stanza four. Stanza four, the law stanza. Those who scorned the Lord and sought but carnal pleasures, who despised his word, and love their earthly treasures. With shame and trembling, they will stand and at the judge's stern command to Satan be delivered. I think it's important. I know it's it's just, you know, that one, and it's right in the middle too, you know. It's, it's one of the harshest statements of law, I think, that we get in any of our hymns. It's, it's very direct, and we need that. We need that because those are the rightful wages of our sins, right? And I think it's important to remember when you hear this reading, also from Matthew 25, there is this great little point that we forget about. And they're delivered to Satan, yes, but they're delivered and, and cast into the lake of fire that was prepared for Satan. That lake of fire was not prepared for us. It was never supposed to be us. And because of that, we can sing with confidence stanza five, my Savior paid the debt I owe, and for my sin was smitten. Within the book of life, I know my name has now been written. That, that eternal hellish place was not meant for us. And we are not at the judgment day yet. And there is time for, for all of us to seek the Lord in repentance and to trust in him. Stanza six picks up on that again. Christ, our intercessor, who through his blood and merit frees us from sin, from death, from the devil. So even with some pretty harsh law, there's just this beautiful, sweet gospel message for us here in this hymn. And it's just great. It's, it's, it's great. The law, or I'm sorry, the gospel is so much sweeter because this hymn, in a sense, really brings us face to face with what would be our reality had Christ not lived and died for us. Yeah, there's there's those the the language in this one is very vivid. The the flames upon flames and in stanza yeah. in stanza one and then and but the, then you're right the the very sweet gospel by the end of it and the uh, tune and, is just this like lovely jumpy major tune and when you right. say it before it's almost incongruous which I guess yeah. I guess you know maybe that's how the Lord feels too as he you know when when you talk about delivering people over to this and it's like, this wasn't supposed to be for us. It's supposed to be for the devil. We are to be with Christ. That's what's for us. 
So maybe it makes sense that it seems strange to sing this nice jumpy major tune with some of these early stanzas, but maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, may maybe it is. All right, before we run out of time, we have one more. We're going to oh, make yeah. it through all four of these. I'm pretty happy about that. And probably one of the, the best known end times, end of the church year hymns, Five uh, Lutheran Service Book Five Sixteen Wake Awake for Night is Flying. This is one of one of the great ones. Yeah. What what should we know about this hymn? Oh, so much, but I'll try to go quickly and succinctly. <laughs> yeah, this the hymn's author, both tune and text, is Philip Nikolai, uh, a 16th century, early 17th century German Lutheran pastor. He wrote both this tune and text as well as the tune and text for O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. This particular hymn is often called the King of Chorales. O Morning Star is called the Queen of Chorales. Those are Nikolai's only two hymns in LSB. And, you know, he's batting a thousand if he wrote the King and the Queen. And those are both in there. So, I mean, just fabulous hymns. And, you know, this hymn traditionally was often the end of the church year hymn. And it picks up the imagery of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish virgin, virgins who are awaiting the bridegroom's arrival. But there's a lot of Eucharistic communion overtones here. And, and my word, I think, for this hymn is feasting and gladness and joy. Those are the things that come to mind with this hymn. This text kind of pulls back the curtain of Judgment Day and lets us look beyond that to the joy and gladness and love that awaits us when we are with Christ for all, all time. And so that's just a beautiful, beautiful image. And e what makes it even more striking, I think, is when you realize the situation that Nikolai was living in when he wrote this hymn. He had just been put into a pastorate at a church. And from July 1597 to January of 1598, so we're talking about six months, there was an epidemic that killed 1,400 plus people in his town of 2,500 people. So in six months, the town lost two-thirds, more or less, of its population. And I know that, the, that, that COVID has been difficult on us all, but this is another level. And Nikolai wrote this hymn in the midst of that, that epidemic using as, as some of his inspiration, just that short verse that Paul has in Romans verse eight, where he mentions that he considers the sufferings of this present age, not to be worth comparing to the, or to the joys that await us in Christ. And so, you know, in the midst of all this death and in the midst of all these struggles that Pastor Nikolai is dealing with, he pens this beautiful hymn and it's just incredibly striking. And even, you know, he was a poet. So if you take the hymn and you list it out line by line, phrase by phrase on the paper, and you center all that text, you will see that that text forms the outline of a chalice, which is fantastic. And O Morning Star, his other hymn is the same way. And that is not just a nice side note or something incidental that happened that was very intentional by how he wrote the hymn and wrote the text. And so we see, you know, even now in Holy Communion, when we were up there um, receiving Christ's body and blood, yes, we're receiving the forgiveness of sins. Yes, we're receiving strength to live this earthly life, but we're also getting a little foretaste of that heavenly feast that this hymn is describing for us. And he, he illustrates that even by how he constructs the poetry to take the shape of a chalice. Very cool stuff. A wonderful hymn. Yeah, this is definitely a favorite for many people. It is, it is so good. The text is wonderful. The tune is so fun to sing. And one of the ones that, that I know I look forward to at the end of the, when we get to the end of the church year with yeah. Advent right around the corner. Well, um, uh, Matt, we're all out of time. I know we could talk for hours about all of this, but thank you so much for joining me today to talk about these hymns. My pleasure. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for asking. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. Look 
The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.